All right, all right, all right. Here we go. Time for Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week. I am Randy Patrick, your host today and every day, I guess. Uh, lots going on, and you know what? A lot to cover. Uh, this will be probably a bit of a longer video, so I'm going to give you the heads up right now to you know hang through it as much as you can. I'll try to talk as fast as possible, but I was obviously waiting uh, to see what happened this week with some fairly important uh, news that was going to be released this week in the real estate industry. So we got lots to go over. Let's get into it. So the number one piece of news clearly that everyone was waiting for this week uh, was the decision by the Fed whether they're going to raise rates or not. So if you don't know, the Fed did raise their rates this past week at their uh, quarterly meeting and um, they raised their rate by a quarter point this week. So up 2.5 or 0.25 basis points. So there's a lot of speculation that they may not and actually pass on this and there was a significant amount of pressure from a lot of sources from the president from industry people saying you know you're gonna hurt the economy you're going to hurt housing in particular if the rates keep going up uh, because houses are, are, are just unaffordable and with respect to rising interest rates it puts them farther and farther out of the reach of the average person but guess what that didn't happen and they still raised their rates anyway so clearly the Fed thinks that the economy is strong, that wage growth is there, and that this is what they have to do to move forward. Now, the only, I guess you could say, positive outlook that came out of this was the fact that there was a planned rate increase for three occasions in 2019, and they stated that they're going to reduce that to two. So in 2019, we'll only see two rate increases, which certainly is better than three. So uh, that's kind of the scoop on that. Now, what does this mean? Obviously, that mortgage rates will continue to rise, and you know, housing will be cooling probably because of this cooling, slowing down, correcting, whatever words you want to use to describe the market. We're seeing it happen right now. Uh, I think it's a combination of you know prices that have gotten totally out of control, unaffordable for the average person, unaffordable for a middle class wage earner, let alone you know the average person. And with rising interest rates, just making it more and more difficult uh, for people to purchase homes. Uh, will this for force prices down? Well, I don't think the rate itself will force prices down, but just the sentiment among home buyers and the public that things are too expensive will force it down. We're seeing a lot of activity right now, a lot of things happening in many markets across the country. So re remember, you know, after the last housing crisis, we went through uh, a number of years, what was called quantitative easing. So the Fed basically had virtually zero, um, you know, rate increases for a, a long period of time to stimulate the economy, to get people back into, uh, I guess, say the the habit of buying houses going forward after the crisis, etc. So we've been able to recover from that and realize that you know rates were in the sixes and sevens and maybe even some of the eights uh, prior to the housing, the previous housing crash. So. People right now, I mean, we're used to having almost a decade of you know rates in the threes and fours. So now having it go into the fives, high fives, approaching sixes, um, people are not comfortable with that. And again, it's one of the, I think it's a it's a mental stumbling block. You get so used to something so low that when it increases a little bit, you don't want to jump on board. Now, again, does it make a significant inter, you know uh, difference in monthly payments? Sure, it does, and people don't want to pay more than they have to. But again, realize that it was much more expensive, or the rates were higher prior to the last housing crisis. Uh, than they were right now. So again, and also one thing, uh, the rates have to go higher for rates to come down. So if the Fed's desire in the future is to do some more quantitative easing or to, or to bring rates back down, you can't you know, go from one or two to bring them back down to zero. They gotta climb a little bit to come back down to a reasonable part. So again, that's the scoop right now at the Fed. So they did the raise the rates and people are asking, and that's kind of been a lot of stuff I'm seeing online, the chats, the whole bit. Uh, the, did the Fed just kill the housing market? I don't know. We're going to have to see in the new year what happens. All right. Now, funny enough, FHA, the Federal Housing Authority, raised their loan limits. Now, effective January 1st, uh, the loan limit ceiling uh, is up to $726,000. That's um, up from $679,000 from 2018. So loan limits are raised, I guess you could say, by county. And this raise is available uh, in 3,053 counties across the U.S. That's the most counties that were allowed an FHA uh, loan, lim loan limit increase, which is something else. So clearly, you know, you've got one part of the government, which is obviously FHA's Federal Housing Authority, going, we need to sell houses, people need to buy houses, so we're going to do what we can to compensate for 
feds, you know, the federal government ra are raising interest rates and, um, you know, and again, the high prices. So you've got one aspect, rates going up, other aspect, loan limits going up to sort of counterbalance that. So that's, I guess, a positive thing for consumers, for buyers, how that's going to play out. I mean, again, the more rope you have to hang yourself, you're still going to hang yourself, right? So again, uh, still having 3% down mortgage is just it's less, it's just a bigger house you can buy with less down payment money and more mortgage to hang yourself. That's how I look at it. So again, home builders are still crying the blues as well too. Housing starts are down year over year for the second month in a row. Single family starts fell 4.6%, the lowest since May of 2017. Multifamily is up. So when you see some of the reports, it may say housing starts overall had an uptick. Well, that's because multifamily permits were up 15.4%. So the multifamily is driving some of the, I guess you could say, optics in the overall housing, uh, you know, home building, housing starts, etc. Builders are slashing prices and they're also cutting production because they look at it going, if I, have to, if I have to slash my price now to sell my home, why am I going to build more homes at that price knowing I'm going to have to uh, offer discounts and other things in the future. So builders are going to, are and will reduce probably their construction volume in the new year, that's for sure. Again, back to concerns about profitability and if prices continue to drop they're going to have to do that home builder sentiment index which is you know the thought about the marketplace is down to its lowest point in three years so clearly builders are seeing uh, things a little differently like they, than they used to as well builder home stocks have taken a huge hit this year they're down between 30 and 40 percent which is uh, pretty pretty big and again they're they're not meeting their you know they didn't meet their q3 numbers they've readjusted and lowered expectations for q4 numbers and they've already reevaluated and lowered expectations for, for 2019 numbers as well too so once again uh, builders are building in higher price ranges to either make money earn money etc keep themselves above water they're not building in the affordable housing area which needs inventory the most but also that's that's you know the hardest place to make money i suppose because again not you know giving builders a hard time land costs are up entitlement costs are up material costs are up skilled labor is up so it's tougher to make a dollar overall in the housing industry for sure all right existing home sales we heard this past week that there was a small increase month over month for existing home sales. We're talking like a little over 1%, not huge, but the overall drop from November 2017 to November 2018 was down about 7%. That's the ninth month in a row that we've seen a year over year uh, decline. So from nine months each, comparing year to year, 2017 to 18, nine months in a row decline. It's the biggest drop we've seen since February of 2011. And for the four regions, so I guess how they break it down, there's obviously four regions, Northeast, Midwest, South, and West. Well, the Northeast dropped 2.6%, Midwest dropped 4.3%, the South dropped 5.6%, but the biggest drop was felt in the West, which had a drop of 15.4%. So that's where uh, I guess the market's getting hit the hardest. And again, realize that you're gonna see big drops because you saw bigger and quicker greater appreciation in a lot of the West Coast markets here. So that's not a surprise. Now, if you want to talk markets, let's talk markets right now. In Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis saw a 12.6% increase in listings for November. Buyers signed 5.2% less purchase agreements. So we see an increase in inventory, but we also see a decrease in, I guess, contracts being signed, homes going pending leaves about 10,000 plus active listings in the greater Minneapolis area. So now they're starting to see a lot of inventory come on, but the inventory is not necessarily bringing buyers, which is very interesting. In Colorado, Denver area, inventory jumped 47% in November. Uh, th that was a 17% month to, oh sorry, they had a 17% 17 month to month drop in sales in October. Sales are down 12% for the year-over-year -year month of October, all right? And in Vail, of all places, which I found very interesting, Vail said there's a growing number of seriously underwater homes in the Vail area. About 15% of the local market is currently underwater. That's the second highest in the state in the situation. If you ask what does underwater homes or seriously underwater homes mean, it really boils down to two things. It's the appraised or, or, or value of the home in the current market and the mortgage on the property. So 15% of homes in Vail 
the mortgage is actually greater than the value of the property, which means if you're going to sell your property, you actually have to come to closing with 15% of, you know, 15, well, not 15, of whatever the difference is if you want to walk away from your property. So that's kind of an issue. So when people are serious, and now again, seriously underwater, uh, it's not just underwater, because if you're 1%, if, if your home is 1% value uh, over your mortgage, you're underwater. Seriously underwater actually means 25% or more. That's a significant number. A quarter of you know, your home is, is under, you know, quarter value is, is a difference there. So again, tough to sell your home when you gotta bring 25% difference uh, to the closing table. So people either become house poor, uh, they try to ride it out, or this is where short sales can happen in the very near future. The reason I guess Vail has a problem is because Vail is a smaller location. I guess it has a, a, a fixed number of people that live there year round, but population and activity swells during certain months because it's, in, it's a destination type of uh, area, a resort area. Well, obviously with ski, skiing, wintertime activities, whatever that is, probably winter, summertime too. But again, a lot of the homes in Vail are, are seasonal. People don't actually live there year round. Las Vegas, we heard about Las Vegas. There's roughly 10,000 plus single family homes on the market today. Uh, 7,000 of those homes last month had zero offers. So homes are sitting there doing nothing. That's a 54% difference from a year ago. That's huge, all right? Realtors are now telling residents not to panic. Things will get better. I don't know how they can say that. I don't know how, how, how they can predict it's gonna get better. Uh, I just see more volume coming on in Vegas and prices going down. Now realize that Las Vegas also had a fast and large appreciation. It was probably one of the more hotter locations the past year, at least in 2018, for appreciation. And of course, when you have the exponential appreciation, you tend to get hit the hardest on the way down. So what comes up does come down usually with the same speed and acceleration. They're having a hard time in Vegas, but I do have to snicker. You know, again, realtors are telling their customers, you know, um, not to panic, everything's okay, not to panic. Well, again, one more thing that we do when we're, when we're trying to protect our market and trying to influence the market as well too. And I think we've gone over it in previous videos, it's words are not going to influence buyers, buyer sentiment, mortgage rates, home values, the market, the people, the numbers are going to influence what they do. All right. In the Dallas area, total home sales for all of North Texas were down 8% from the previous November. House, uh, houses for sale in Dallas County grew by 29%. So the inventory is up 29% in Dallas County and the surrounding counties are seeing double digit sales drops and a significant increase in inventory as well. So a lot of stuff happening in the Dallas area in Orlando. Haven't talked about Orlando in a while, but sales fell almost 7% for November. Inventory grew to 3.3 months supply. Now 3.3 months is not still a huge supply. A typical healthy housing market runs about six months supply of inventory. So it's still really a seller's market, so to speak. But again, if the buyers aren't gonna buy, more inventory is gonna come on and that 3.3 month supply is going to increase in the very near future. In Seattle, King County area, the median sales price jumped, or sorry, not jumped, plunged to $644,000 in November, which was down from a peak value of 726 in the spring. So again, $726,000, that's an 11.3% drop in six months. Um, last time it dropped this much was just before the last housing bubble imploded uh, back in 2008 in the King County, Greater Seattle area. So now we're starting to see things happening or, or getting to levels where stuff happened back in 2008 when the first housing crisis came on on, on the scene. So very interesting, interesting to see that, but again, the bigger, more higher accelerated markets are gonna go down harder and faster. Now, California, according to CAR, which is the California Association of Realtors, downward trend uh, for the seventh consecutive months in sales. Uh, sales were down 3.9% from October, down 13.4% when compared to November of 2017, so year over year. And the median sales price was down between October and November of 3%. So it was 554,000 from 572,000. That's 3% from October to November, month to month. So now we're actually starting to see sales prices slide. LA Metro down 10%, LA County down 11.2%, uh, Orange County down 14.4%. That is sales compared to last year. Across the state of California, active listings rose 31%. 
uh, year over year. That's the eighth consecutive month of inventory rises in California. Interesting to note that 41 of 51 counties reported on by the California Association of Realtors reported sales declines and 26 of those counties posted double digit drops. So we're not again talking 3%, 5%, 7%. We're talking double digit issues here, people. Uh, Sonoma County, haven't heard much of Sonoma County lately. Uh, that's of course just north of the Bay Area wine country. Crashed about 9% in November. Uh, that's sales prices. Uh, very interesting. Atlanta, no statistics, just some comments. Many more homes for sale, less overall sales, and obviously hoping to get some statistics on that as soon as possible. In San Diego, uh, San Diego area led the nation in 2018 with the most home price reductions at 20.5%. So again, you know, basically a fifth of the market reduced their price in 2018. Funny enough, San Diego is tied with my market here in Tampa at 20.5% of price reductions across the board, which is very interesting. All right, and again, that's 20% of the market. Like, and we talk about things that are happening out there. We're not talking a couple points here and there. We're talking double digit, significant double digit numbers that are now affecting the marketplace, not in just one location, across the board. So we've talked about Seattle, we've talked about the Bay Area, we've talked about San Diego and LA, Dallas, Denver, Minneapolis, Atlanta, Tampa, Orlando. I mean, you know, I'm not even talking about New York today. I mean, New York, obviously the, the, the mid condo market is hurting right now and, and just so much has been going on. So it's not just one isolated location. We're starting to see this into many other locations. Now, what we do see though, is we usually see West Coast, East Coast, markets have issues first, then it works its way into the central part of the country. All right, the Midwest, you know, again, you know, we haven't heard much from Ohio, Missouri, Indiana, etc. A Detroit area, we'll hear about that probably coming soon. Uh, but again, noting, noticing that Minneapolis is having some issues right now as well too. So as note, mortgage applications down 5.8% for the past week. Also, I read an article which I found kind of interesting is that millennials do not have enough funds for down payments. So again, part of the issue, if, and you read this, it's almost like this gets posted every quarter, every couple of months, talks about the millennial generation being the next largest generation that can purchase properties uh, in the marketplace. But the issue is that they have a lot of, we'll call it debt with student, uh, student debt, student loan debt, and other life, I guess you could say life uh, achievements or life things that you want to do before you, it's time to buy a house. So. The real estate community likes to talk about the millennials being the savior and this huge buying pool that's going to help the marketplace. But when you look at the true information, less and less millennials want to buy a home, less and less of them can't afford to buy a home, especially now with rates going up. So, uh, and as a, a result of that, now we see things like, you know, FHA raising loan limits and stuff like that. So again, it's money chasing payments. Let's get people into homes they can't afford. Let's see what we can do to get them to, to be able to afford the monthly payment. And we're not going to care about value declines, things like that. So it's a little bit of a situation uh, with a generation that I don't really think people have the correct handle on whether they're going to buy property or not. And again, you know, it's different from the baby boomers, different from Gen Xers, whatever you want to call that. It's, you know, each, each generation has its own way of life, doing things, thinking, pop process the whole bit. And I, I think that, you know, putting so many eggs in the millennial basket is not doing anybody any favors here. So realize they don't have the money, or the majority of them don't have the money to, to have down payments to purchase homes. Now, one thing uh, came out, uh, Adam Data Solutions released their home affordability uh, for Q4. And again, this happened this week. And what the home affordability, I guess you could say, um, analysis is, it, it shows that the US median home price in the fourth quarter was the least affordable level since Q Q3 2008, which is when all the housing crisis issues started to happen. So this is more than a 10 year low. And the report calculates and it creates a, an affordability index based on the percentage of income that you have to have to buy a medium priced home relative to historic averages in your county. So just to note 76% of the 469 counties that they look at uh, are less affordable than the long-term averages for the county. So 
What that means is that it's tougher to buy a home now, tougher to afford a home right now. Now, I find it interesting, well, not really interesting, but I guess it makes sense because you're gonna say, well, if we see price decreases and all this inventory, why is it still unaffordable? Well, don't forget, because the analysis is probably based on sold transactions, and just now we're seeing all this inventory come on board, we're seeing all this, all the price reductions come on board, and transactions, you know, will like what's happening right now will be reflected in transactions 30 days, 60 days, 90 days in the future. Um, when they do the affordability index, they calculate what has occurred with true sales transactions, which would be November data, October data, et cetera. So that's how, that's how they're going to do it. So right now, we're still the most unaffordable we've been since the last housing crisis, which really started 2007, 2008, okay? So here we go. Another analyst calls out the market. I've spoken in the past about, you know, Bank of America calling out the market, the Redfin CEO calling out the market, um, Robert Schiller being careful to not call out the market, make his comments, et cetera. But there's a new person that basically said we have some issues. His name is John Burns. He's a real estate analyst and he runs a consulting company. Now, from I actually have his book and have followed some of his information. It's usually pretty good. Um, he focuses a lot of his analysis and industry on the, you know, on the home building industry, the new home industry. And according to his survey, which he took the, for the past month, he said sales were down 19%. Now I know he's referring to new, the new home market, uh, but he said that he would call that a correction. That's a direct quote. quote. So John Burns of John Burns Consulting um, would say that I would call the current situation in a correction. And, and again, he's referring to, I'm not sure whether he's referring to the overall market, but at least the new home market is talking about a correction right now. Now, I look at that going, that's a relatively strong word to use. People don't like to say the word bubble. They don't like to say the word crash. It's, it's a slowdown, a cooling off period, uh, you know, fixing the imbalance in the marketplace. Now, this is a correction. So for me on the, you know, when I take, take a look at the words you can use to describe our housing market, that's probably the strongest word that's been used right now. People are not saying the word crash. I mean, we've all got to, gotten used to saying the word bubble because we are bubbling, we have bubbled. I think bubble's a fair word right now. But, you know, when there's a bubble, there's usually a burst and a pop, uh, a crash. So we're not quite at bursting crashing at this point in time, we're at correcting. So it's almost like every month, we just kind of inch that um, adjective up one more notch. So we're, I think, one away from the word crash. So we're getting there, guys, we're getting there. All right, and uh, I want to also emphasize that a lot of groups, namely real estate agents, when I, I look at all the blogs, articles, et cetera, that I read, to the, that I get this information, a lot of people are still saying, well, you know, we see a lot of things happening right now, but it's to be expected because this is the seasonal change in the marketplace. This is a time when, when real estate markets are traditionally slower than the, rest, than the rest of the year. I do agree with that, but a slowdown is a slowdown. A slowdown is a few percentage points here and there. It's not double digits. That's the difference. Okay, that's where we're moving to that stronger correction word, moving towards crash. So I agree we're in a slower market time. It's a, it's a season, you know, winter, holidays, the whole bit. Uh, and again, but that's usually a few points. It's not double digit, 20 points, 15 points here and there. That's a significant or more meaningful, uh, I guess you say movement or lack thereof. So and realize I don't think we've seen a slowdown this fast, this much ever, as I can't remember that myself. And again, information is much more available right now. So what's gonna happen? So we're, we're sort of riding out the end of 2019 here with a couple of things. Higher interest rates, highest unaffordability on record. We're now seeing the result of that in uh, much more inventory coming on. We're seeing sellers reducing their prices and starting to panic a little bit out there. So 2019 is going to be a year of uncertainty. We know we're going to see two more rate hikes in 2019, that's gonna be a certain thing. So my gut feeling is gonna tell me that we're going to see more homes come on the marketplace and we're gonna see more aggressive sellers reducing prices or just starting the prices off lower. That's what we're gonna see for sure. And buyers are probably going to start offering lower prices to start. Some of the other comments I hear from various locations across the country that have been very hot in the past where sellers receive multiple offers 
I guess, you know, they're not going to receive multiple offers on the property anymore. We're probably going to see price offers or people offering lower than active listing price because they know that they can do so. Before when there's competition, your real estate agent says go with your strongest position if you don't want to be disappointed and get that home. We're now going to see toes in the water. We're going to see, we see buyers in the sideline. We're going to see people going, I'm going to throw an offer in and I'm going to wait for them to respond as opposed to me having to jump through hoops as a buyer and match their price. So we're going to see a, I guess you could say a philosophical and logical shift in how this is being played out right now. So if I'm buying a home in the future, I'm not offering full price. I'm offering 15% less minimum to see what I get. If the realtors laugh at me, fine, I'll wait. I don't care. I've got time on my hands, all right? They don't, they may have issues. Their, their life needs mean they have to sell. So things will change in the seller market for sure. So that's the whole point now. So again, um, people want to see meaningful reductions. I think that's what's going to happen. It's, it, is, it is starting to happen. Um, you know, we're, if we're correction right now, we've got one more level to go before things are chaos, which I think is great. So people are really realizing that things can't go on forever like they have been in the past couple of years. Sellers are going to have to realize that as well too. Uh, another bubble theory concept uh, that's tough to break is the fact that we get used to things going up, things going up, and then when it plateaus and things are changing, it's almost like we don't want to hear the truth or we don't want to understand what's going on or open our eyes because we don't want to believe that things can change. So holding on to that high bubble level is one of the fallacies, one of the issues of the whole bubble concept here. It hurts people in the long run, you need to react to it quicker. So start to plan your housing strategy now, analyze, see what's out there, figure out what you can do, what you can afford. Are you going to sell? Are you going to buy? Are you going to sit tight and see what happens? Well, I look at it going, you need to figure it out, but not sit in the sidelines because you sit in the sidelines, it's going to pass you by and you've missed your opportunity to do whatever you wanted to or needed to do. So for people out there, understand the overall real estate market, understand where it's been, where it's going, what the future brings, understand your local market, learn your real estate trends, read your magazines, go to your local or, or, or look up online your local real estate uh, realtor board and they always have statistics information that you can actually look that's free for consumers. Um, back in the day when we were working the last housing crisis, I had someone that basically you know, made a cool statement and they said, you know, when do we have this once in a lifetime opportunity to buy homes at such a cheap price? I mean, this is great. Like this has, hasn't happened in our lifetime. You know, this hasn't happened since the last depression back in the 30s. Well, guess what, people? Um, the nice thing about that past housing crisis, you know, which is about 10 years ago, is now that we, we're going to have a second chance at that once in a lifetime opportunity. So from my perspective, I want to be ready for it. I want to understand it. I want to take advantage of it to the full extent that I can, not make some of the mistakes I made before. They weren't necessarily mistakes. They were things that I didn't know enough about or take advantage of to either earn more income or build wealth to be comfortable going forward for the rest of my life. And that's where we are right now, folks, is that if you follow the market, if you know what you're doing, if you, or if you want to learn what to do, you get involved with real estate, get involved with real estate investing, because this is truly the second chance at a once in a lifetime opportunity. You don't want to miss it again. All right. So once again, thank you for the views. Thank you for the likes, the video and comments. If you enjoy what I talk about and want to learn more, please subscribe to the channel. And everybody, uh, today is December 21st. So I want to wish everybody out there a very Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, whatever you celebrate or don't celebrate, have a great holiday season. I will look forward to talking to you probably next week sometime. Thanks again.